Welcome everyone to our 4 p.m. event. So this is a science writer's workshop about the Glory and Aquarius missions. I'll give you a little background on those for just a minute and then I'll announce the speakers. Uh, NASA plans to, to launch two new spacecraft in 2011 to expand our understanding of Earth's climate. GLORY, which is set to launch no earlier than February, will study the roles of two critical elements of Earth's climate system, the sun's total solar irradiance and atmospheric airborne particles called aerosols. Both solar irradiance and aerosols have significant direct and indirect effects on Earth's climate, and the two instruments on GLORY will provide new insights into these complex processes. Then in June, NASA and the Space Agency of Argentina, Comisión Nacional de Actividad Especial, or CONAE, will jointly launch the Aquarius satellite, I won't try to say the name of it in Spanish, uh, SAC-D mission, to make NASA's first space-based measurements of how the concentration of dissolved salt varies across Earth's ocean surface. This information will provide new insights into ocean circulation, the global water cycle, and climate. So we have here today to discuss these missions. And are you guys going to speak in the order that you're seated? OK, and uh, speaking in the order that they're seated, I'll introduce them. Um, Michael Mischenko, Glory Project Scientist, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York. Greg Kopp, uh, Glory Total Irradiance Monitor Instrument Scientist. That's the TIM. He's at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Gary Lagerlof. Um, Aquarius Principal Investigator, Earth and Space Research in Seattle, and Yi Chao, who's Aquarius Project Scientist with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Michael Mishenko. I'm the Glory Project Scientist. I'm joined today by Greg Kopp, who is the Team Instrument Scientist, as well as by Hal Merring, our uh, Program Scientist, and Joy Britt Hauer. Uh, she's late. She's our, uh, Glory, she's our Program Executive uh, at NASA Headquarters. Um, we're very excited to tell you about the upcoming uh, NASA Glory mission. Um, which is expected to accomplish two major scientific objectives, uh, increase our understanding of aerosols as, as agents of climate change, and uh, to continue the measurement of the sun's effect on climate. And this, is, uh, this will be accomplished by flying two instruments, the aerosol polarimetry sensor, or APS, and the total irradiance monitor team. Uh, the mission is designed to last for three years at least with five years of consumables, it will fly in the A train orbit at uh, 705 kilometers. It's scheduled to, la to be launched on February 23 from the Vandenberg Air Force Base on the Storus XL uh, rocket. Uh, this is a picture of the Glory uh, spacecraft. It is still at the Orbital Sciences Corporation, but it is expected to be shipped very soon to the Vandenberg. Um, we'll tell you about the uh, science of the Glory mission and how the science will be accomplished. and. Uh, this uh, slide, slide number three, uh, shows you the overarching energy budget equation, uh, which we will help uh, address. On one side, we have the incoming solar energy, which is essentially the, the only fuel, uh, the only uh, source of energy that fuels the climate uh, system. On the right-hand side, we have two components of the outgoing radiation. First of all, it's reflected solar energy and also the immediate long wave energy. Uh, this graph shows you why it is so important to measure the solar output, which fuels the Earth's climate system to a very high accuracy and precision over a long period of time. It also explains you why it is important to address the properties of aerosols, because they can interact with the solar light directly by absorbing or reflecting it back to space. They can also change the properties of the clouds, including their radiative properties, and uh, modulate uh, precipitation. Uh, slide number four shows you the most important uh, radiative forcings. Uh, these are estimates of the forcings. Um, you can see that the largest forcing is that by the greenhouse gases, uh, but the 
climate forcing by the aerosols is as estimated to be almost as significant in terms of its magnitude, although its sign is opposite. You can also see that the uncertainty, the estimated uncertainty in the aerosol climate forcing is bigger than the, for the estimated forcing itself. Uh, the same goes uh, for the solar irradiance forcing at the very bottom of this diagram. So clearly we need to, ask to know these uh, forcings to a much better accuracy. We need to reduce these uncertainty bars by a factor of several. And most importantly, you can uh, appreciate the fact that if you look at the total net anthropogenic forcing estimated at the very bottom of this diagram, uh, the uncertainty in this forcing is very large, and primarily it comes from the uncertainty in the aerosol properties. So as I've, as I've said, the mission uh, science objectives will be addressed with uh, two instruments, the aerosol polarimeter sensor, which will help us quantify the role of aerosols as natural and man-made uh, uh, agents of climate change, and the total irradiance monitor, which will continue the 30-year uninterrupted record of total solar irradiance measurements. Uh, this uh, slide number six uh, shows the Glory spacecraft. The team is mounted on a gimbal platform which allows it to look constantly at the sun. And APS is on the other side of the platform. It looks al always at the earth and looks at the aerosol and, and uh, aerosols and clouds. Slide number seven uh, explains what is meant by aerosols. An aerosol is in any particle which is suspended in the atmosphere. Technically, clouds are also aerosols, but they're usually segregated into a separate category. So when we say aerosols, we mean everything suspended in the atmosphere but clouds. And the left-hand side of this view graph shows several examples of aerosols, and they can be natural as well as man-made. Uh, the top two uh, the, uh, pictures show examples of man-made aerosols. This is a yellow fog above Manhattan, and there's a uh, soot particles produced by major fires in southern England. The two bottom uh, pictures show wind-blown dust and volcanic aerosols. These are natural aer aerosol uh, components. As I've said, aerosols can interact with the sunlight, with incoming sunlight directly. They can absorb sunlight, as, for example, black uh, soot particles do. And so by absorbing sunlight, they become warmer and they warm the surrounding air. So they contribute to the warming of the, uh, of the atmosphere. And sulfates uh, is an example of particles that reflect sunlight back to space, and so they contribute to the cooling of the atmosphere. Aerosols also serve a very important role. They serve as cloud condensation nuclei. Without aerosols, there would, would be no clouds. So if we change the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, we, we, uh, in, in this way we can also change the properties of the clouds. And by changing the properties of the clouds and by modulating precipitation, aerosols exert what is called the indirect effect on climate. Even though aerosols are very important, they're equally difficult to study from space, and uh, slide number uh, eight explains this complexity. An instrument like APS looks at an exceedingly complex system composed of different layers of air, of the atmospheric layers, as well as a highly heterogeneous uh, surface. Um, and, by, and the aerosols come in all shapes and sizes and chemical compositions those typical examples of aerosol morphologies. And by measuring the properties of the outgoing sunlight, an instrument like APS is supposed to retrieve or determine all properties of this surface atmosphere system at once, which is very difficult, especially if you use measurements of only the intensity of the reflected sunlight. Then it becomes essentially impossible. But if you also measure the polarization of the reflected sunlight, this problem becomes solvable. It's not easy to, to give a definition of polarization um, in words rather than equations, but we should remember that uh, light is a collection of electromagnetic waves which vibrate. Uh, they can, our eye, the human eye, is sensitive to only to the, to the amplitude of these vibrations, which is the intensity of light. But the directions of the vibrations can be quite different, and this, this is what is called polarization of light. And APS will be able to analyze the, directional, the direction of the vibrations of the reflected sunlight, and this is where the useful signal comes from, because the direction of the vibrations, i.e. polarization, uh, provides a lot of information about the microphysical properties and the total uh, amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, and makes the problem solvable. Slide number nine summarizes the um, aerosol polarimetry sensor. 
which is built at the uh, Raytheon uh, Corporation. This instrument, as I've said, will measure not just intensity I, but also the uh, other two Stokes parameters, Q and U, which define the degree of polarization of light. And it will measure these uh, Stokes parameters, IQ and U, in nine spectral channels, uh, which cover a very wide spectral range uh, from 412 all the way up to 2250 nanometers. Uh, the polarization accuracy, this is what makes this instrument truly unique. It's very high, and you need to have polarization accuracy of, of order of 0.1 or 0.15 percent in order to solve the aerosol problem. Um, even more than that, APS will look at the same piece of real estate from 250 different view angles. So if you multiply 250 view angles by nine channels by three Stokes parameters, you collect a lot of information. And uh, uh, this information will help us to uh, retrieve the or determine the properties of the aerosol particles with the requisite accuracy and uh, specificity. Uh, Glory will fly in the so-called afternoon constellation of satellites, uh, the, also known as the A-train. It will be flying just behind the Calypso spacecraft. Uh, it doesn't matter for the team instrument how we fly because all uh, the team instrument does is look at the sun, but for APS it is very important to be a member of the A-train because there are other instruments on these uh, platforms which look at the same piece of real estate and uh, retrieve other properties of the air, of the atmospheric surface system. So APS will help the, those instruments by providing additional information about the aerosol and cloud particles. It will also use the help from those instruments because, for example, the Calypso LiDAR provides uh, very accurate information about the vertical distribution of the aerosol and cloud particles in the atmosphere. So by combining these retrievals, we'll fully exploit the synergy of these types of measurements uh, to our advantage. Uh, now Greg Karp will tell you uh, about the team instruments. Thank you, Michael. Um, ah, well, like Michael showed, we're trying to understand with Glory the climate impacts from radiation balance. This picture again shows us the incoming radiation and all of that radiation is coming from the sun. The sun provides nearly all the energy that's, that's really driving the Earth's climate. It exceeds by 4,000 times all the other sources that give energy into the climate system, all other sources combined. Um, so Gloria's total irradiance monitor will be measuring this incoming energy very precisely. Um, that incoming energy is actually variable, luckily not too extremely variable. It varies by 0.1 to 0.3 percent over a few days. Um, that really has a negligible effect on climate. The Earth's climate system can't respond to changes that quickly. But over the 11-year solar cycle, which you see here in this 32-year long record of spacecraft measurements we have of solar irradiance, you can see that the sun's output varies pretty well by 0.1 percent over that 11-year solar cycle. That does have an effect on climate something we really can see in temperature changes on the Earth in atmospheric circulation patterns. Um, so we, we do have a good measurement over the last 30 years of what the sun has been doing. What we'd also really like to know is over these very long time periods, decades to centuries, how does the sun vary? We know a lot less about that because we've been measuring it only for the last 32 years very accurately. Um, but you can see in the lower right on slide 11 here the sunspot record. We do have direct measurements of sunspots going back to 1610. Um, and it not only shows the 11 year solar cycle you can see going up and down, but it also shows longer term gradual variations in the sun's output. And we can only guess really what that means in terms of radiation incident on the Earth, but our, our best models are showing that it's about a 0.1 percent decrease uh, for these very long time periods, um, and those do have direct impacts on, on climate. This period here, known as the Maunder Minimum, when the sun was relatively inactive in the late 1600s, corresponded with a little ice age in Europe, time when temperatures were a bit colder than they usually are, rivers froze over that don't normally freeze over. Uh, so good connection between what the sun is doing and what's happening on climate. 
So the sun is variable. What we'd like to know is as the sun varies, even by these small amounts, because it's such a big energy input, the dominant energy input to the Earth's climate system, how does it affect our climate? Um, we, we determine that sensitivity by taking our record, and this again is our 32-year spacecraft measurement of several different instruments that give us total solar irradiance. Um, we use that as one of four inputs that in this case, it's Dr. Lean at NRL who put together to model up inputs from the sun, inputs from volcanic aerosols, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, a kind of weather pattern over the Earth. Those are natural influences, plus anthropogenic forcing, greenhouse gases and aerosols. Um, all four of those combine to nicely fit global temperatures that you see in the top plot here. Uh, but we need to have, we need to know what each of those four inputs are very well in order to determine what's causing these temperature changes. And then by taking this direct measurement of total solar irradiance and these other contributions and extending them back in time, the solar irradiances via the sunspot record I showed in the previous view graph, we can go back. Here we show historical record going back over 100 years. We can go back and we can determine the sensitivity of climate in terms of degrees per decade of change that we can attribute in climate change to each of these parameters. And you see that the sun is responsible over the last 100 years or so for something on the order of 10 to 15 percent of the warming that we've been seeing. So this is how we determine the climate sensitivity to the sun. And when we're trying to understand climate, we need to be able to attribute to different effects how much of climate change is natural, how much is human caused. So Glory's total irradiance monitor will be trying to measure the sun to, to help us attribute the natural effects. This is actually the record of total solar irradiance over the last 32 years, contributed to by several different instruments. And you can immediately see that these instruments don't all agree with each other. And I should point out that the scale here is very expanded but because these instruments, they're measuring something that's very stable, because they don't agree exactly, we have to have overlap between each of them. The only way we can put together a continuous record, like I show here, is by having had those instruments overlap for the last 32 years. Um, and Glory will be continuing this record on uh, after the SOURCE mission, which is the most recently launched NASA mission to measure irradiance, and it includes a predecessor to the total irradiance monitor that will be flying in GLORY. So GLORY will be extending the record after the SOURCE mission um, and contributing to this long sequence from all of these other instruments. GLORY will be not only continuing the record but also improving its accuracy. This is a cutaway of the total irradiance monitor. The TIM has four black absorptive cavities inside of it. It's a fundamentally very simple instrument. These, these four cavities will absorb all the incoming radiant energy across the entire electromagnetic spectrum from the X-rays to the, to the far infrared. That measures the total amount of energy coming in from the sun. Precision apertures in the very front of the instrument determine the area over which we've collected that radiation. So essentially, by knowing how much energy we have coming in over what area, we can compute the total amount of energy that's incident at the top of the Earth's atmosphere that drives our climate system. And that's very fundamentally how the instrument works. The science questions that will be addressed with the data from the TIM and with the science team that we have for this instrument uh, will, will help us tell what the exact value is of the sun's input to the Earth's climate. It will tell us how variable the sun is. And by making these measurements accurately enough, we'll be able to take the measurements from GLORY and compare those to measurements 100 years in the future uh, with enough accuracy to be able to discern small changes in the sun's output over decades and over centuries. Um, we'll be able to, to discern, as, as we have been with prior measurements, but hopefully more accurately with GLORY, what activities, what solar activities cause fluctuations in the sun's output to understand what it is driving the sun and, and what, how that affects the Earth. Uh, so we are going to be determining also the sensitivity of the Earth's climate to solar variability. So these are the four fundamental questions that we'll be addressing with the GLORY-TIM instrument. Let me 
now turn things back over to Michael to conclude the glory instrumentation. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so in one of the early slides, I referred to, to the fundamental energy budget equation uh, with the incoming solar light on the left-hand side and with the reflected and emitted energy on the right-hand side. Uh, if the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, there is no change in climate, but if they're not equal, there is a climate change. It can be either warming or cooling, and we need to, det to be able to detect whether there is imbalance, and we need to attribute this disbalance to specific causes. As we have shown, uh, the aerosols are a very important uh, component of the climate system and the most unknown component of the climate system, and that's what makes APS a unique instrument. It is the first space instrument which was specifically designed to address the aerosol problem with unprecedented uh, accuracy and specificity. And I'd like to emphasize the words human produced because the aerosols represent one of a few climate components which are directly affected by the human activities. We can increase or decrease the amount of aerosols and change their composition. And so the knowledge of the human produced change in climate is extremely important because it can affect uh, policy decisions. Uh, the solar input is also extremely important and we need to know it to a very high accuracy. We need to continue this record of uh, uninterrupted measurements because only, as Greg explained, only by having this uninterrupted record we can know how the sun behaves over a long period of time. So both instruments will provide much needed contribution to improved understanding of the Earth's energy budget and its man-made comp uh, component. And so these are the major objectives of the Glory mission, and we are really excited that it's going to be launched soon and will help us uh, solve the scientific problems. Now, uh, the final slide shows uh, three websites where you can find much more information about the Glory mission. Uh, www.nasa.gov slash glory is the official Glory website at NASA headquarters, and there are also some two interesting uh, websites about the Glory mission and the Glory Twitter at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so this concludes the Glory presentation, and our, uh, Gary will tell us the, about the upcoming NASA Aquarius mission. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I begin, just let me uh, reintroduce my colleague Yi Chow, uh, an oceanographer from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who's a project scientist, um, and uh, other members of our team here, Eric Lindstrom from NASA headquarters is the program scientist, and Annette DeSharon is our educational and pub public outreach coordinator. Um, in talking about Aquarius, I'm going to direct your attention away from the sun and the atmosphere and the energy budget of the earth and back down into the ocean and the, and the ocean circulation and the water cycle and how those uh, elements influence climate. The Aquarius mission is one to measure sea surface salinity from space and the focus is to understand the interaction between the ocean circulation, the global water cycle and climate. What this briefing will cover is what is ocean salinity, how do we define it, why is it important to measure ocean salinity from satellite, how we will measure ocean salinity with the Aquarius mission, who's participating in the mission, and a little bit more information about the mission. Just a few features about the project. Um, again, the principal measurement is sea surface salinity. The coverage, we're going to cover basically the global ice-free ocean. With a spatial resolution of 150 kilometers, it's about 93 statute miles on a monthly time scale. The science, as I said, is ocean circulation, water cycle, and climate. Our launch is in June 2011, just about six months from now. Uh, the minimum operational life, like Glory, is three years. Uh, this mission is part of NASA's Earth System Science Pathfinder program. It's actually the last of the series of the Pathfinder missions. It's also a partnership between the United States and Argentina. The key science objectives, uh, first of all, from an observational point of view, we want to observe the seasonal and year-to-year -year sea surface salinity variations. We want to use this data to investigate how they link to other measurements of the water cycle and ocean circulation and climate variability. With this kind of information, this ultimately will feed into ocean circulation models and improving them and improving climate models to help us in our ability to forecast and predict future climate change. What you see on the right-hand side is a photograph of the observatory from about a month ago. It's presently at the Laboratory for Integration and Testing in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The reason it's in Brazil is part of our, our partnership with Argentina. 
Uh, and this is, uh, just to give you an idea of the scale here, this is about, uh, the, the solar panel here is about seven feet in dimension, seven feet square. Okay, here we have a little bit of an animation to show you what Aquarius uh, would look like on orbit. Uh, this, what you're seeing here is a top view of that antenna reflector. Uh, this is the largest rigid microwave antenna that's been built for an Earth remote sensing mission. It's about three meters or about 10 feet in diameter. Uh, it only weighs about 22 kilograms, which is about 45 pounds, so one of us could probably pick that up if we could handle it. These three openings that you see here are the microwave radiometers. Here you'll see a picture of one of the antennas being deployed. Uh, this is the top view of the satellite. These are the star trackers here and GPS antennas and, and other components. Solar panels are over here. And again, this is the top view uh, of the satellite on orbit. That's what it will look like when we get it launched. Uh, now, uh, what we're going to measure is sea surface salinity. What we define, how we define sea surface salinity is simply the concentration of dissolved salt in water. Uh, it's a mass ratio, so it's the number of grams of salt dissolved in a kilogram of seawater. This map here basically shows you what the range of ocean salinity is at the surface based on all our historical observations. The lowest salinities are about 32, which are here in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. The highest that we find are in the central uh, subtropical North Atlantic Ocean, where the salinity is as high as about 35. Nowadays, oceanographers use electrical conductivity measurements to determine ocean salinity instead of old-fashioned chemical techniques. Uh, so we use something called the practical salinity scale, and oftentimes oceanographers will refer to salinity and practical salinity units, which is equivalent to grams of, of, of salt per kilogram of seawater. The Aquarius accuracy will be 0 0.2 uh, PSU, and I'll explain a little bit about the significance of that. Um, in this slide, I want to direct your attention to the connection between the water cycle and ocean salinity. What you see here is a reproduction of the map I just showed you on the previous slide. We're on slide number 24 now. Uh, this is a map on the right-hand side of evaporation minus precipitation. So the areas that are colored red in this map here are dominated by evaporation. The areas that are colored blue are dominated by rainfall. So it rains more in the blue areas, it evaporates more in the red areas. And as you can see, there's a correspondence between the red colors on this map and the red colors on that map, and likewise with the blue colors. So the areas that it rains the most are diluted, and so it has a lower surface salinity, and where there's more evaporation, the salinity is higher. But you also see that there's a disparity between the Atlantic Ocean and the other ocean basins. The Atlantic is saltier than the other oceans. The reason is, on average, there's more evaporation than rainfall and river runoff into the Atlantic Ocean, and that maintains a higher salinity there uh, than in the other ocean basins. This is very important for the mechanisms of ocean circulation and how ocean circulation can regulate climate. Now, what you see here is a map of a, a sort of a cartoon map of what we call the conveyor belt or overturning circulation. This is very schematic. I don't want anybody to walk away thinking that the ocean currents are this kind of ribbon pattern, but just to give you an illustration. But the higher salinity of the North Atlantic Ocean allows the water that flows northward into the North Atlantic, uh, it, when it cools off, to be dense enough to sink to the bottom. And we have a little animation to give you a general idea of what this overturning circulation looks like. It starts here. You see here these light colored arrows moving northward. This is the northward flowing circulation. In reality, this is a narrow current called the Gulf Stream right next to the coast. But again, this is just a schematic idea of how this works. As this circulation flows up towards Greenland and Iceland, it loses heat to the atmosphere. It becomes denser and sinks down to the uh, deepest layers of the ocean and begins the return flow back southward uh, through the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the heat that's delivered to the atmosphere as the surface water cools off is what moderates the climate of northern Europe. And this deeper overturning circulation helps maintain the climate as we know it today. In the geologic past, there have been influxes of fresh water from melting glaciers and so forth that have disrupted this overturning circulation and caused climate, extreme climate variability. As you can see now, this circulation penetrates down through the deeper layers of the ocean into the South Atlantic and joins the southern um, ocean circulation around uh, the African continent and into the Indian Ocean. So this is just a basic idea of the overturning circulation. It's an important coupling mechanism between the water cycle and climate. Now, Aquarius accuracy. I said earlier we're going to measure salinity to 0.2 PSU. That's about two parts in 10,000. 
I have some assistance over here from Yi Chao. He's going to give you a little bit of a demonstration. We're going to observe changes of this, uh, on this precision over a month's time over every patch of the ocean that's about 150 kilometers square. And 0.2 PSU change is the same as putting about an eighth of a teaspoon of salt into a gallon of seawater. So Yi's got a, some salt here. He's got a little tiny measuring spoon that equals one eighth of a teaspoon. He's going to put it in that gallon of water. All right, and he'll put the top on and rattle it around a little bit. Okay, so it can mix. So Aquarius, over a month's time, will be able to detect a change in the salinity of the ocean, equivalent to what we just changed in this bottle of spring water here. We have some plastic cups if anybody wants to come up after the talk and take a taste of this and see if you can actually tell whether, whether this is salty water or fresh water, you're welcome to give it a try. But this just gives you an idea of, of how precise we have to measure ocean salinity to do this and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But first, I want to cover this particular diagram here. Salinity is a piece of uh, an important, uh, important variable that we need to measure in the ocean to understand ocean circulation. Salinity matters because it's one of the terms that, that governs the density of seawater, uh, temperature being the other term, and the other is it acts as a tracer for changes in the freshwater cycle. So when we see changes in rainfall and evaporation, melting and freezing of ice, we're going to see changes in ocean salinity. From space, we already measure sea surface temperature and we have solar flux, as we just learned from, from Greg's talk. On the hydrologic cycle, we have measurements of rainfall and evaporation over the ocean. For dynamics, we measure sea surface elevation from altimeters and ocean vector winds. From these, we can get the ocean circulation. We also have biologic components for measuring ocean color. But to tie all these things together, the thermal and the dynamic with the hydrologic cycle, we need the measure of ocean measurement of ocean salinity, which Aquarius is going to provide. So again, it, fits, it fills in a very important missing piece in our toolbox of ocean remote sensing. How do we measure ocean salinity? That's the question I get asked most often. Um, basically, we're going to use a microwave radiometer. A microwave radiometer is basically a very sensitive radio receiver. It just listens to the natural emissions off the sea surface and measures the amplitude of that. That radiance is, is modulated by the electrical conductivity of seawater, and just the same way as oceanographers measure salinity by putting an electrical conductivity meter into the ocean, Aquarius will, will measure using some of the same physical principles because the electrical conductivity modulates the emissions off the sea surface. We measure these emissions in something called brightness temperature, and I think the battery just went out on this pointer. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side of that diagram, we're on slide number 28. Uh, that's brightness temperature. That's the thing that we measure with the, with the uh, radiometer. And along the uh, uh, horizontal axis, you have sea surface temperature. And as you can see, I've got different curves there for different levels of salinity. So if, thank you, Eric. We have a backup pointer here. All right. So um, if, if we were going to take a measurement right off the California coast today, the sea surface temperature is about 12 degrees Celsius. And uh, so if I were to go along here on this, on this temperature scale and measure water that's 12 degrees Celsius, and we put an Aquarius radiometer out there, and if we measured 91 kelvins with that radiometer, then where these two lines intersect tells me that the salinity would be 37 PSU. Well, it turns out that the salinity off the California coast is not 37. It's more like 32 or 33. So the actual measurement that we would have seen with Aquarius would have been closer to 94 kelvins. And so with a change of about three kelvins, we're seeing the whole dynamic range of, that we see in, in the open ocean between about 32 and 37 PSU, which, mean, which is not a very big change. Which, this means that Aquarius has to measure some very, very, very small changes in brightness temperature. And this requires um, some advanced technology. So the Aquarius instrument design required a couple of really important innovative new technologies in order to make this science possible. The first is of ultra-stable calibration. We're calibrating this instrument to a tenth of a Kelvin. This is unprecedented. This is about a factor of 10 better than any other microwave instrument that's flown in space. And the other important element here is that we're integrating a radar with the microwave radiometer so we can measure sea surface roughness. And there's a scatter plot here on the lower right-hand corner. The point of this is that when the wind blows across the ocean, uh, it makes waves and sea spray and foam. That affects the emissivity off the sea surface, and we have to correct for that in order to get a true measurement of the ocean surface salinity. So the radar basically measures that wind roughness, and we can use that radar information to make that correction. This is a diagram that shows uh, how the mission is designed and how the sampling strategy is going to work. The satellite will be launched into a sun-synchronous orbit. 
Uh, that means it crosses the equator with, at the same time relative to the sun. It will cross the equator at 6 p.m. Uh, local time when it goes from south to north, like you see in this tract here. And then when it's going from north to south, it will go along this direction and it will cross the equator at 6 a.m. Uh, the orbit altitude is 650 kilometers. We're going to cover the ocean every seven days, so we'll get four repeat cycles every month. We'll average that data monthly. Uh, this gives these, this, these uh, oval shapes that you see down here, these different colors, these are the three different um, uh, positions of the three radiometer uh, footprints on the ground. And as you can see, they have slightly different dimensions based on how far away they are from the satellite. This is what the swath would look like going along the surface. Basically, as the satellite moves along, we cover the ocean surface in a swath-like pattern. So uh, in the first several months of the mission, Aquarius will collect just about as many observations as all the historical data that's been collected from ships and buoys in the past. So this is one of the advantages of making measurements like this from space is that we get uh, much better spatial and temporal resolution. Um, this next set of sequences, I'm just going to give you a quick illustration of, of what we gain and what we don't gain from Aquarius. Uh, this is a picture of the ocean surface salinity uh, in the same kind of uh, color rendering I've shown you before. This is just in the Northwest Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and uh, here the red colors are high salinity and the blue colors are low salinity. The, this is from a, uh, an operational numerical model that the Navy uses called HICOM. The spatial resolution is 12 kilometers in this model. If we uh, sample this the way Aquarius would sample it with those footprints that I showed you in the previous diagram and average up the data, uh, we would see a picture that looks like this. And wherever you're sitting in the auditorium here, you may not see a whole lot of difference between these two. The idea, the point here is that we're not really losing much in terms of spatial information from that large Aquarius footprint size. Uh, the difference between those two uh, shows the number of small scale structures. Uh, but if you compare that with what we can obtain from the, the various uh, ocean buoys that are taking measurements today, this is what the sampling density would look like from current ocean buoys that are deployed in this particular part of the ocean. So as you can see, the difference between this diagram and this diagram uh, is quite significant. Okay, a little bit about our international partnership. Uh, this is a partnership between the United States and Argentina. Uh, this diagram shows how the work is divided up. NASA is on the left-hand side and, and the Argentine Space Agency, CONAI, is on the right-hand side. NASA is providing the launch, which is a Delta II rocket from Vandenberg, as I said earlier, and then we're build, we have built the Aquarius instrument, which you see here. Uh, so we're also doing all the salinity science and that part of the mission operations for managing the Aquarius instrument. CONAI, on the other hand, has built the satellite bus. They built a number of uh, instruments that meet some of their own science objectives, and they're doing all the mission operations and the ground control from their station in Cordoba, Argentina. Okay, just to wrap up here, I have a few summary bullets to, to kind of remind you of the key points I wanted to make here. Aquarius will address the links between ocean circulation, the global water cycle, and climate. The Aquarius' sea surface salinity will provide a key missing link in satellite Earth observations. And lastly, the Aquarius applies innovative new instrument technology to obtain uh, unprecedented measurement accuracy. And then for more information, this is the aquarius.nasa.gov website. There's quite a bit of information in here. There's also quite a bit of educational materials that you can access. Uh, there's, there's a handout that most of you received. There's a, uh, a feature article about Aquarius from Oceanography Magazine that was published two years ago. There are a couple of copies of that magazine on the back table if you want to take that with you. And there's some, uh, also some posters, educational material that you can have there. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so I think it's time for questions. Is that right? Uh, okay. Okay, do we have questions? Hi there, yes. Uh, it's a question for Gary. It's Jonathan Amos from BBC News in London. Do you have some observations on the European SMOS mission, which has been trying to, uh, to measure ocean salinity over the past year? And I'm probably aware of the rather torrid experience the mission has had as a result of uh, radio frequency interference, um, not just soil moisture, but over the oceans uh, as well. And no doubt you're going to encounter um, that experience too. 
Uh, yes, the, this actually, are you hearing me okay in this microphone? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a really good question. There's a couple of things to say about the SMOS uh, mission, how it differs from Aquarius. Uh, first of all, SMOS stands for Soil Moisture Ocean Salinity. It's a dual, mission, dual science mission. Uh, the primary science drivers for how that mission was designed were focused on measuring soil moisture. That's why the SM comes before the OS in the, in the name of the mission. Um, and it, it was always uh, viewed as, a, as kind of an experiment to see how well we could do salinity with it because the, the design is not idealized for ocean salinity. What, what we did differently with Aquarius was really focused on ocean salinity and what the measurement requirements were there in terms of accuracy, calibration, stability, um, and spatial and temporal resolution that were important for the, what we thought were the key science objectives. Um, so uh, the other factor is that, that SMOS employs a, a thinned aperture uh, um, the word phased array design, uh, which is much more difficult to calibrate than Aquarius is going to be, and so they're running into some of those problems. With regard to the radio frequency interference issue that you uh, mentioned, that, that has plagued SMOS. They've done a lot of work on, on uh, dealing with some of the emitters, particularly in northern Europe. Um, Aquarius actually anticipated this problem, and one of the other technological uh, factors that went into the design of the Aquarius instrument was that we have actually built, tested in, uh, and built an RFI filter uh, using measurements that we've taken from rooftops and other places to see what the characteristics of that radio interference would be. And so we built a filter into the processor. Um, it hasn't been tested from space yet, but we think we will we'll have sort of a leg up on that problem once we get on orbit. And uh, I mean, do you have plans to, to, to share data between the, uh, the two groups? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, the two groups have been working in concert from the very beginning of, of the development of both missions. We, we um, participate in each other's science team meetings. Um, I, I sat on the SMOS science advisory group for about seven or eight years. Uh, and we've been sharing information, algorithms, approaches to problems, things like that. There's been a great deal of communication between the two groups. And we sort of see each other as, as one team supporting two missions in a lot of ways. Hi, right, uh, James Dacey, Physics World magazine. Um, it's a question about the GLORY mission. Because uh, you're saying it's, um, it's designed to get a more accurate picture of solar irradiance. I was wondering, at the moment, how sensitive are climate models to, to this feature? Climate? Climate models historically have used what they call the solar constant. It's a misnomer because you've seen that the sun really isn't constant. Uh, but to the level of fidelity that older climate models have had, they really could call the sun constant. The models are getting sophisticated enough now that they do need to know actual solar variability. Um, so more sophisticated, newer, modern climate models are including and accounting for solar variability because they're realizing it drives a lot of the circulation patterns in, in the atmosphere particularly. Um, it, it, over the 11-year solar cycle, you can see different effects in the stratosphere fairly high up in the atmosphere and, and other effects lower down in the troposphere that affect weather down lower. Um, so climate models are including a lot of solar variability now. They're even taking things a step further. The very newest climate models are not only looking at total solar irradiance, which is what we measure from Tim, but also variations spectrally, that is across the wavelength range. They're looking at how different regions are varying and how those particular regions affect different layers in the Earth's atmosphere. So climate models are including a lot of solar variability effects now, and that's why we no longer call it the solar constant. We now call it TSI, or total solar irradiance, which is a more appropriate term. I mean, in terms of rising temperatures on Earth, I mean, is, is the contribution from this variance in the sun, is that, is that minor compared to things like rising CO2 emissions? Um, it's minor compared to CO2. It's kind of a 10 or 15 percent effect compared to the anthropogenic effects, the human-caused effects, over the last 100 or so years. Prior to that, prior to the large increases in CO2, a lot of the long-term variability that we saw in climate was natural. It had to be at that point, and most of that did come from the sun. Uh, but even as we go forward, as carbon dioxide is now much more prominent than a lot of the natural effects are, um, as we're starting to set climate policy based on the inputs that are driving climate change, we need to be able to distinguish how much of climate change is stuff that we can control and how much is purely natural. Um, so at the 10 or 15% level, 
the sun is still a contributor and still something that we need to understand. More questions? Hi, I'm Jillian Kemsley from Chemical and Engineering News. So what data are you actually going to be collecting about aerosols on glory? Are we talking size? Are we talking chemical composition? Are you going to be able to tell black carbon from mostly sulfate particles? What are you going to be getting out of it? Uh, we cannot, of course, determine the chemical composition from space. We're not flying through a cloud or aerosol plume. We cannot collect the particles. We're not subjecting them to a chemical analysis. But what this mission is going to do for the first time is to determine the refractive index of the aerosol particles. And this is the best proxy that you can get from space to the chemical composition. The refractive index of water is 1.33. The refractive index of water ice is 1.31. Of mineral particles, 1.53. So by determining the refractive index, uh, we can get a fairly good idea of the chemical composition and thereby of the origin of the particles. Is it a natural particle or a man-made particle? And this knowledge simply doesn't exist at this point from space. Uh, the existing satellite instruments cannot do that at all. So the, the refractive index or chemical composition and the particle size distribution uh, will be the microphysical properties uh, that we'll retrieve. And also the particle morphology. You look at a spherical sulfate particle or like a branched fractal soot particle or an irregular mineral particle. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to retrieve these properties uh, of, of, of the aerosols, as well as their total amount in the atmosphere. And again, almost all of that will be done for the first time. Other questions? OK, well, that wraps it up then. Thank you very much for coming and speaking about the missions, and to everyone else for being here, too. Our next press conference will be tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thanks for your attention. Stable Antarctica. Oh, it'll be about unstable Antarctica, what's driving ice loss. Thank you.